Um, this is the largest room I have to show the archive. It's obviously laid out like a laboratory because after all this building was a, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a hospital for animals, veterinary medicine. Um, I am standing in a room which is about dialogue again. This is the dialogue between Poland, okay, and Scotland. The image of St. Andrew, crucified, martyred, upside down, is defined by the Scottish flag, the saltire. That's Scotland. This is Scotland in dialogue with Poland. Their um, flag, or their, their, their patron, I mean, he's the patron of Scotland. This is the patron of Poland. She's called the Black Madonna. She has two scars on her cheek here, made by a scimitar, a soldier, representing the Muslim world. And um, she saved Poland from being taken over by uh, the invading army of, um, well, those who believe uh, in the religion of Islam. Okay, uh, th these are all images showing the, how artists react to the image of the Black Madonna linked to the image of Scotland, which is a, a cross like that. Now, on the uh, table in front of me here, you have um, evidence of the history of the Edinburgh Festival, and a large part of this archive is about the festival. I've been to every single festival, so naturally <coughs> you have very important programmes. You have this programme, and the work on the front, uh, decorating the front, is by someone who taught me, an artist called um, Robin Philipson. You've got, um, and this was 1959. I, I remember the festival um, going back a long time, including this one from 1955. And this is again um, a Robin Philipson. But the festival changed for me dramatically in the 60s when the director of the festival was someone called uh, George Harwood, Lord Harwood. And he um, conducted, uh, well, he, he, he directed the program um, in a way that made me realize he was really an artist. <laughs> He wasn't just the director of the Edinburgh Festival. He was a patron of the arts and an artist himself. And by 1964, this is 64, I found myself involved in the, art, in the official festival as an artist because he put on an exhibition dedicated to the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare. And there I found myself, Edinburgh International Festival, 1964, uh, and that's my image of one of Shakespeare's plays, Much Ado About Nothing. And that's the image of Edinburgh. I was delighted to be invited by the director of this exhibition, Richard Buckle, uh, to take part in the official festival programme. So I want to point out that my life has not been just about the fringe. Many people think, uh, 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 think of me as part of the fringe. Of course, I've been part of the fringe, but I've been also part of the official festival. And many of the works that you see here, especially those defining the history of the festival, were as a result of my work as director of the official Edinburgh Festival Exhibitions of Contemporary Art. So let's look at this. 
Lord Harwood eventually um, left. First of all, there he is. And he created many, how can I say, um, aspects of the festival which inspired me. And one of them was um, to create something called the Traverse Theatre. Uh, because I had a feeling that this, uh, this world that he represented uh, of international culture should happen for longer than a three week period. It should happen all year round in Edinburgh. So the Traverse was a kind of um, an experiment in that. And in fact, these two uh, directors of the, of the Edinburgh Festival were essentially my patrons. This is Lord Harwood, and this is Peter Diamond. And um, I love what uh, Lord Harwood said. He said, um, we must remember that we should be, we have a responsibility to give to the festival goer what they will be experiencing, not today, but tomorrow. So it's about experiment, and it's about bringing all the arts together. Look, if you photograph all of these, th th this particular period, 1961, 62, 63, 64, 65, is um, to remind us that if you have a certain kind of director of the festival, you have a very powerful theme and being expressed. And I think that when he was director of the festival, he was reminding, reminding everyone in Scotland that they should consider the culture of the multilingual culture of Europe. So you had the sound of other languages other than English being heard through opera, through plays, and the sound of music that could not be expected to come from Scotland. You had um, people like Schoenberg. In fact, uh, the, the, the music program was um, everything imaginable uh, from um, some of the greatest composers alive at that time. Um, and it also introduced the world of Covent Garden Opera. We didn't have an opera house in Scotland uh, like Covent Garden. Anyway, there was Schoenberg and there was um, the extraordinary, um, how can I put it, performers. There were conductors like Herbert von Caravan, uh, Rudolf Kemper, Carlo Maria uh, Giulini, um, Rudolf Kemper, and then Otto Klemper. You also had um, Lord Harwood saying, what makes a festival? And of course, again, I, I will reiterate what he said. We aim to give the public what is going, it is going to want tomorrow. That rang a bell with me. Um, what is the point of festivals, he was asking. I was asking that too. Well, for me, the point of the festival was it was a place of education. I couldn't believe it was like being given gifts, an abundance of... It was, it was a university for me, a university of the arts. Um, and I felt very close to other cities where there were festivals like Salzburg, um, where there had been a tradition of festivals sort of before the war. Um, I'm trying to think of this period of the 60s because it really did change my life. There's Schoenberg, look. He was in Edinburgh, amazed to find so many concerts, so many manifestations of his music. Very important. 
Um, and of course, there was a great exhibition dedicated to someone called Ein Epstein. <laughs> um, Epstein um, doesn't have a Scottish name or a British name. <laughs> it's uh, a kind of uh, continental name, suggesting that um, the festival had to take care to bring the best art imaginable, the highest standards, to Scotland. Now, the Edinburgh Festival continued right until we now have, uh, in the present day, um, the programmes of somebody uh, that uh, is now finishing his, uh, his years uh, as director, Sir Jonathan Mills. But my work here, I suppose, is not just about culture. Um, I found myself looking at a page in the Edinburgh Evening News uh, suggesting that I was part of a group of human beings associated with Edinburgh um, who were not just in the world of art. There's this person here, David Hume, the great skeptic, one of the world's leading philosophers and a leading light in the, uh, well, I suppose it was the Edinburgh Enlightenment, that other period when Edinburgh didn't have a festival, but it had some of the great thinkers in the world living and working here in the 18th century. Patrick Geddes, the father of town planning. Uh, Crystal Macmillan, one of the leading uh, lights in the suffragette uh, movement and a peace campaigner. I'm so proud to be associated with them. It means I'm not trapped in the world of culture because culture should be something which is to do with um, the whole experience of belonging to society. I was fortunate to work with Joseph Boyce and Joseph Boyce was one of the few people that I could trust to help bridge the gap between the world of art and the world of, for example, peace campaigners, um, Green Party uh, members. In fact, he was a great artist, Joseph Boyce, and a German, but he was also co-founder of the Green Party. Now, I suppose I'm an artist. I have a responsibility for making marks on a piece of paper. And here you have my reaction to the festival when I was still at school in 1948. As a Holy Cross Academy schoolboy, I was privileged to see the rehearsal of the Three Estates, which was one of the great, great moments of, in the history of the festival. Um, Three Estates was a masterpiece, and it was questioning deeply as a play uh, the state of Scotland in the 16th century and the relationship between uh, the people and the people who ran the country. You know, the aristocrats, the, the lords, um, the uh, bureaucracy, and the church. So, I uh, am I. I'm fortunate to be there. I would never have been there. How can I say? I would never have experienced that amazing production. I think I had been, before that production in 1948, last shown in um, either Cooper or the Nilithko in the 16th century. My goodness, what the Edinburgh Festival did for my life and for the life of my generation was incredible. So here we've got, um, if you look here, my um, world in Edinburgh. Um, when I was asked to be uh, the rector of Edinburgh University, 
goodness gracious me. So there was a generation of students way back uh, in 1978 at Edinburgh University who asked me to be their rector. That was the first generation, but I was asked by four other generations, so I've been asked five times to be the rector of Edinburgh University. So I'm connected with the world of, well, the world of academe, the world of university uh, learning. And that somehow urges me on to consider uh, the kind of work I, I should be concentrating on, which is to use this archive, because uh, that's what it is, as an, a form of academic research. See all the boxes? They tell the story of various aspects of the festival. Uh, they, they extend my idea of um, all aspects of culture being essential uh, to the, a proper education especially for people who are, call themselves scientists and who end up as politicians or lawyers or accountants um, or generals or police, policemen or doctors. I believe a proper education takes into account every aspect of uh, what we call culture. So, look, dialogue. A dialogue with Paul Nagu, Nagu. Dialogue with a Hungarian dance company, a dialogue with a publisher called John Calder, um, and here a dialogue with someone when this photograph was taken who was um, a convicted murderer in Baldenic prison. You can delve into anything here and find that there is no separation between the world of the artist and the world of society in general. And not just Scottish society, British society, European society, world society. Over a period of, um, oh God, a period of 60 years. Here is Sean Connery working with Polish filmmakers. And at that time he was James Bond. He was the hero. Superman, who was fighting against the enemy, which included the people of Poland. That was a nonsense. Anyway, you've got him in front of the Democratic Gallery with an image of Auschwitz with one of the Polish filmmakers. Now that's a dialogue, a highly creative dialogue. Sean Connery supporting, as James Bond, the enemy. Okay? So, I want you to take on board the, uh, the work of the, um, the, the work of what you call the Travis Theatre and the DeMarco Gallery. Uh, I think it's difficult to explain that, what that work is if you confine it to uh, the world of culture. Come this way. <laughs>